Now, this is a. Uh, uh, do I hold this up now? I okay. Day. Oh, okay. All right. We're going to take a look now at a picture of the Beatles uh, in 1960. Uh, John Lennon, George Harrison, and Paul McCartney, of course, are easily recognized, but the fourth member of the group doesn't really look much like Ringo Starr, and that, of course, is because he is not. Uh, he is Pete Best. He was the original drummer in this group until he was bumped for Ringo. That took place in 1962. He is now out of the music business and is making a special appearance here tonight. We're pleased to welcome Mr. Pete Best, ladies and gentlemen. Attached to this no, there's no, that, no, no balloons. Okay. We had a guy here the other night who uh, went up in a lawn chair with the balloons attached to it. Uh, welcome to the program. You're uh, honestly one person I never thought I would get the opportunity to meet, but you're somebody that I've known about, uh, well, since 1962, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, let's just uh, start at the beginning. What, how, did, how did the relationship come about between yourself and John Lennon and uh, George Harrison and uh, Ringo Starr? Well, very shortly. Um, I first met the guys when they opened my mother's club, the Casbah, way back in 1958, when they were known as the Quarrymen then. And there was John, George and Paul, and another guy called Ken Brown. But we needed a group to open the club uh -huh. on a Saturday night. This is a club that your mother operated? That's right, yeah, yeah under the basement of a house. Uh -huh. And how old were you at that time? Oh, I'd be about 16. And uh, the, the other guys were roughly the same age also? Yeah, you know, yeah. we were... Uh, couldn't give a damn uh -huh. attitude, you know. Just but, uh, high school kids? Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, from there. But the uh, funny thing was, the club needed some decorating. So John, in his wisdom, for those of you who don't know, John was a little bit short-sighted. Uh, we were painting the club ceiling black, mm -hmm. and it was supposed to be matte paint. So and John did it in gloss paint, uh -huh. and uh, <laughs> that was it, you know. So uh, when... Um, now... <laughs> The, you and the rest of the guys were helping to finish or fix up this club in order to open it for business. They came over and were painting and so forth. That's right. Yeah. Now, when did you get to be part of the, uh, uh, the musical group? Well, uh, just an aside, I joined them uh, August 1960, mm -hmm. uh, simply because of the fact that they disappeared and they went and had an audition for a guy called Larry Parnes. And by this time, they changed the names of the Silver Beatles. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy who joined him called Stu Sutcliffe, who very tragically died a couple of years later. But uh, after this particular tour, when they uh, went up to Scotland, there was a guy called Tommy Moore, who was playing drums with them. And he came back and he said, whoa, he said, I've had enough. He said, I'm quitting. So Paul knew that I'd been uh, playing drums. And uh, he said, Pete, you know, we've got the offer to go to Germany. So uh, he said, are you interested? I said, yeah, very much so. And he said, come down and audition, which is what I did do. And went down the next day, bashed off about six numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, five minutes later, they said, yeah, Pete, you're in. Yeah. So uh, what was the extent of your musical background at that point? I mean, you were good enough to pass the audition, obviously, but what had you, had you done much drumming before? Oh, for about uh, two years on and off. Yeah. I had a small combo of my own, you know, yeah. which was like a fun group. Yeah. Uh, but nothing sort of professionally based, because... Uh, I knew the guys had to go back to job, go back to school. Yeah. So now, when you went on the tour to Germany, was this the beginning of the feeling that this thing may go right through the roof, or was this still a little earlier? No, when we went over to Germany, and uh, we were out there for about a month, and we suddenly realized, you know, hey, German audiences are going wild about us. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was always an inner feeling, Dave, which it was funny to explain, but we knew, you know, that, uh, you know, we, in fact, we had a saying. A lot of people don't know this, but... Uh, we used to get on stage and we used to stand there, you know, and say, you know, where are we going, guys? To the top. Yeah. Now, that was the inner belief which we had right. amongst ourselves, right? And it was funny, but we knew that somewhere along the line, we were going to make it big. Yeah. Now, truthfully wise, I don't think even they would have envisaged that we were going to become the phenomena they were. Yeah. Uh, were. Were you close to these gentlemen at the time? Were you all really good friends? Did you get to be a really tight unit? Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, you know, when you're playing... Take Hamburg, for instance, seven hours a night, seven days a week, yeah. you know, 15-minute break if you were lucky or something like that. Uh, we grew up together, yeah. you know, a lot of hard times, a lot of fun together, so we were a close, 
compact unit. Okay, let me uh, pause here for a second, Pete. Uh, we're going to uh, run a commercial or something, and uh, we'll be back to continue this discussion with Mr. Pete Best. Uh, welcome back to the show. This uh, gentleman is uh, uh, Pete Best, and we're uh, talking about his... Uh, was the drummer for the Beatles uh, prior to Ringo Starr. You would, went on the tour to Germany, and you were their drummer for two years at That's least. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you, you mentioned you guys were all pretty good friends. Now, how did the... the did you have any hint that you were going to be leaving the group? No, that was the amazing thing, Dave. Uh, when the incident happened, uh, you know, it just happened completely out the blue. Yeah. There was no, you know, forewarning it's all about it. It just uh, was called into Brian's office, and he turned around. I could tell he was agitated, simply because of the fact that he was, you know, pacing up and down and, you know, sort of biting his fingernails, so to speak. But uh, after about three or four minutes, he turned around and said, Pete, I've got bad news for you. He said, uh, in a nutshell, you know, the boys want you out, and they want Ringo Starr in. Mm -hmm. Well, I was completely shell-shocked by this, Dave. Uh, couldn't sort of get my mind together or, you know, whatever. It, you know, trying to sort of get things into perspective. Did you then go to talk to any members of the group, uh, John or Paul? or? No, no. The funny thing about it was, uh, after I was kicked out, uh, very shortly after that, I joined a group called Lee Curtis and the All-Stars. And on two occasions, I played on the same bill as them. One was at the Cavern in Liverpool, and the other was at the Majestic Ballroom. And we were playing support to them on these occasions. Mm -hmm. And it meant that as we were coming off stage, the Beatles were going on stage. But nothing was ever mentioned. There was no acknowledgement. I Nobody can't... said, sorry, Pete, or we'll talk to you later about it, or it was business, or nothing? No, yeah. just stony silence. Yeah, and from the, the time that you got uh, let go to the time that... Did you know Ringo at all? Uh, had you met him before? Sure, yeah, Ringo and I were very good friends. Yeah. Yeah. So from the time you got let go to the time that they just became an in unbelievable success, what, what amount of time was that? Ooh, uh, basically they had a record in the English charts within a month or so of me yeah. being kicked out, and after that it became history. Everyone knows about it. Now what does that do to a person? Uh, what, is there resentment there? Is it... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, first, you had, these guys were your friends, yeah. and suddenly they're not your friends. That's tough enough, but to suddenly see them uh, skyrocket like that, not to mention the economics involved in the thing. <laughs> <laughs> were, you, were you angry at them, mad at them? No, just in a part, Dave. Uh, they caused me a lot of hardship, grief, you know, financial embarrassment. But uh, I persevered with my own lifestyle. And, you know, that was strong enough in character to sort of turn around and say, OK, no matter what happened in the past, let's forget about it. Mm -hmm. OK. And at this present moment in time, I've managed to retain my identity in my own sweet way. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, continue in music? Did you, you mentioned you were with another band. Did that, uh, I mean, at that time, there was a good chance that a band coming out of Liverpool could be a, a big success. Many were. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, I had mediocre success. Um, I got a couple of records in the charts, uh -huh. uh, you know, a couple of TV spots, nothing fantastic. Yeah. But uh, the gap was always widening, you know. The Beatles were up there, somewhere down on the lower ranks, I was slotted in somewhere. Yeah. So then, um, what? you're no longer in music, what happened after you, you mentioned that these uh, had some other hits, or smaller hits, what, mm -hmm. minor successes, what did you do then? Well, uh, up to about 1968, we uh, persevered, did a tour of America and Canada, had a couple of albums released over here. But uh, unfortunately, through no circumstances of our own, we had to go back home. And um, we found when we got back home that things had drastically changed, you know. Uh, we'd been away for about nine months, we got a lot older. <laughs> and uh, the scene had changed. And when we tried to break back into the normal routine, it wasn't there. Uh, yeah. You know, we sort of persevered, but... Yeah. Uh, it just didn't happen. Well, here is the album. Uh, we'll pause here for station identification. We'll be right back. Uh, Pete Best is here. In a minute, we're going to take our second look at the uh, National Fancy Food and Confection Convec Convention. You know what I'm talking about. It was held here a couple of weeks ago. We were all there. Uh, and uh, I want to ask you about the album. The, the other thing I wanted to, to ask you was, what was the reason ultimately given to you for the change at the position of drummer? Uh, in a nutshell, Dave, jealousy. Um, we found out afterwards, uh, at the meeting, they turned around and said that I wasn't a good enough drummer. But consequently, when we sort of turned around, a lot of people, had, you know, found out that uh, jealousy was creeping into the act. There was actually uh, some, some demonstrations and people uh, in the streets yelling, and they were upset at the, the yeah. time, weren't they? It was a nice feeling, you know, to 
uh, realised that I had true loyal supporters. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, there was a hell of a fan reaction. You know, yeah. Billboards and everything. Uh, and the, anyway, the album, which uh, we alluded to uh, in the last half hour, called Silver Beatles. What is this, essentially, when people put this on their machines at home? What are they going to hear? Well, what they're going to hear is, uh, hopefully so, uh, <laughs> is the decorotation material, which was recorded way back January the 1st, 1962 was the first major attempt for the Beatles to land an English recording contract. Mm -hmm. And never before heard, uh, as far yeah, as you know? Yeah, there could have been bootleg versions, but this is the, uh -huh. the one which everyone's going to go for. Okay, well, I certainly hope this is, uh, <laughs> is, a, is a big success for you. It was a pleasure meeting you, sir. It's uh, an in interesting tale. I'm sorry it didn't work out better for you. Though. Thank you, David. Feet best, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sir.